Throughout history, there have been many reported cases of unexplained mysteries that were eventually debunked as hoaxes, natural phenomena, conspiracy theories, or superstition. But there have also been some events that remain unsolved cases, where there seems to be no logical explanation and even experts are unable to determine their cause. On the 6th of April, 1966, at around 11 a.m., a group of students and one of their teachers at Westall Secondary School in Clayton South in Victoria, Australia, witnessed a strange phenomenon that they couldn't explain. They reported that they saw an unidentified object that was gray in color and shaped like a saucer flying over the grounds of the school. They further described it as having a slight purple hue and being about twice the size of a family car. The object passed over the school and disappeared behind a nearby group of trees, but about 20 minutes later it returned. It then increased its speed and climbed into the sky, flying northwest before departing, reportedly while being chased by five other unidentified aircraft. In the days that followed, teachers attempted to downplay the incident and children were told not to speak to the media about what they saw. They were then visited by men in suits who told them that there's no such thing as flying saucers and that they were not to talk to anyone about the incident. One of the teachers who managed to take a few photos of the craft had her camera and film taken away from her and never returned. Weeks and eventually months passed by and the mystery started to fade as there was no logical explanation for what had happened. The Australian newspaper, The Age, stated that the object was in fact a weather balloon, since the Weather Bureau had released a balloon at Laverton at 8 a.m. that morning. It also stated that a number of small airplanes had been circling the balloon, but a check later confirmed that no commercial or private or RAF pilots had reported anything out of the ordinary in the area at the time. This theory was supported by a man named Brian Dunning who stated that a nylon windsock that was being towed by an RAF plane would also be a likely explanation, as this exercise was known to be used by the RAF at the time. But those who witnessed the event maintained that it was in fact not a plane or a weather balloon, and to this day it remains an unsolved mystery. In 1845, 32-year-old Emily Sagi was employed as a teacher at an elite boarding school in Wolmer, in what is now known as Latvia. Before finding work there, however, she had taught at 18 other schools but was relieved to finally find a permanent position. One day, while she was teaching a class of 17 girls, she was writing on the board facing away from the children when an exact copy of her appeared out of nowhere, standing directly beside her. It seemed to imitate her movements, and although everyone in the class could see it, Emily couldn't. After that day, the doppelganger was spotted on several more occasions, sometimes sitting next to her while she ate her lunch. On one occasion, Emily was helping one of the girls get dressed for an event at the school when the strange double appeared. The girl looked up and noticed what was happening and immediately fainted. The best known incident, however, was when she was outside of the classroom doing some gardening. A class of 42 girls who were learning to sew saw her outside and when their supervisor left the class, Emily came walking in. At first, the students didn't think anything of it until one of them noticed and told the others that Emily was actually still outside in the garden. One of the girls was brave enough to approach the doppelganger and touch it. She described it as feeling like a mass of cobwebs that allows your hands to pass through it. When Emily was quizzed about the strange events, she stated that she had no idea what it was as she had never seen it and had no control over when it would appear. It would later come to light that she had taught at so many other schools and had been let go because of this strange entity. Many parents decided to take their children out of school and eventually, the principal had to let Emily go yet again, despite being a very good and naturally gifted teacher. The only explanation she could ever give 
was that the double seemed to appear to people when she was very tired, and it remains a paranormal mystery. On the 29th of December, 1972, Eastern Airlines Flight 401 experienced difficulties and crashed into the Florida Everglades, claiming the lives of Captain Bob Loft and Second Officer Don Repo, along with 99 passengers. It would later be revealed that just prior to the crash, operators heard one of the men saying, we did something to the altitude. He then says, we are still at 2,000 feet, right? Before the transmission cut out and the plane hit the ground. Upon investigation, it would be found that a combination of system malfunctions and temporary distraction of the crew was to blame. As investigators looked through the records of the flight, they found that there had been some form of distraction in the cockpit that caused the crew to move around more than usual. The plane had been set to autopilot at 2,000 feet, but even a slight bump of the steering systems would have disengaged it, and it seemed that this was the likely cause of the crash. The plane had dropped about 500 feet, unbeknownst to the crew, as the plane's systems failed to register the change in altitude. In the months following the tragedy, employees of Eastern Airlines started seeing both men on flights that they were working on. Many high-ranking employees and pilots told of their experiences. One flight engineer stated that while he was doing pre-flight checks, Don Repo appeared to him and told him that he shouldn't bother as he had already checked the plane and it was ready to fly. A flight attendant also said that on one flight, she noticed someone in the plane's galley wearing a flight engineer's uniform while seemingly fixing the oven. She immediately reported it to the serving flight engineer, who informed her that he was the only engineer on the flight. However, she insisted that she saw the man, and when she was shown a photo of Repo, she recognized him as the strange apparition on the plane. On another occasion, a passenger got out of her seat to fetch one of the flight attendants as one of their staff members had sat down next to her, looking unwell. When they returned to the seat, both the passenger and the flight attendant saw Don Repo sitting in the seat before slowly fading away and vanishing completely. On another occasion, three flight attendants all heard Repo's voice saying, watch out for fire on this plane during the last leg of its flight. The plane experienced engine trouble, but did manage to land safely. One of the attendants had seen his face in the oven door, and they later realized that it was made from materials that were recovered from the fateful Flight 401 crash. In the 1950s, a Spanish artist named Giovanni Bragolin created a series of paintings of different crying children. They were made as an homage to the orphans of World War II, and people in England seemed to like them, with mass prints being sold all over the country. Then in September of 1985, the Sun newspaper printed an article that stated Ron and Mary Hall had lost their house to a fire after a frying pan burst into flames. The entire house was razed to the ground, save for a print of one painting, that of a crying boy. Ron Hall's brother, Peter, was a firefighter and he told them that this wasn't the first time that a house had been completely destroyed, with the only remaining item being the same painting. Within days of the article being printed, hundreds of readers contacted the newspaper, claiming that they had also been cursed by the paintings. Some claimed that it was responsible for the deaths of loved ones, while others stated that when they tried to burn their copies, they wouldn't catch fire. Firefighter Alan Wilkinson later stated that he had personally seen more than 50 crying boy fires. The Sun then asked anyone with unwanted copies to send them to their offices and they would destroy them on their behalf. On Halloween, staff destroyed over 2,500 copies of the painting, but its legend still lives on as a cursed object and unexplained mystery. In 1702, a man named Thomas Busby, a known criminal, was married to a woman named Elizabeth, the daughter of a small-time crook named Daniel Audie. Audie lived on a farm in a small village, which made it the perfect place for him to continue his illegal coining operation. Busby, who lived just three miles away, was the original owner of an inn near Sandhutton, 
and the two became partners in crime. But the two men didn't have the most amicable relationship, as Busby was often annoyed at Audie for one reason or another. On one occasion, Busby returned to the inn while drunk and in a foul mood, and when he saw Audie sitting in his favorite chair, he lost his temper and attacked him. He forcefully removed him from the chair and threw him out of the inn. Later that night, still seething over the incident, Busby went to Audie's house and ended his life with a hammer. He tried to hide his victim in the woods, but concerns grew over Audie's sudden disappearance, and a local search was organized. When his remains were found in the woods, there was only one suspect, and Busby was arrested and charged with murder. He would receive the death penalty, and it said that as he was being led to the gallows, Busby asked if he could stop in at the inn to have one final drink in his favorite chair. He was granted permission, but as he entered the inn, he cursed it, saying that anyone who sat in his chair would meet an untimely demise. Then in 1894, a chimney sweep was having a drink at the inn with a friend, and both men sat in Busby's chair. He never made it home that night, and his friend later confessed that he had robbed him before ending his life. During the Second World War, the inn was a popular drinking spot with RCAF airmen. They would dare each other to sit in the chair, and those who did are said to have never returned from their missions. In 1968, Tony Earnshaw, who would later own the inn, overheard two airmen goading each other to sit in the chair. They both did, and after they left that night, the car left the road, crashed into a tree, and ended both of their lives. A group of builders who were drinking at the inn on one occasion dared the youngest of their workforce to sit in the chair, and he did. He would later fall through the roof of a building, landing on concrete, and instantly losing his life. Earnshaw then placed the chair out of sight in the inn's cellar, but a delivery man decided to sit down in it. Shortly after, his van left the road and he too lost his life. 2006 saw the launch of the Absolute Radiometer for Cosmology, Astrophysics, and Diffuse Emission Machine, which was built by NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. The machine, also known as Arcade, would make it possible for scientists to detect radiation from the universe's earliest stars and to possibly solve some of the universe's unexplained mysteries. It was able to do this with the use of seven sensors that detect electromagnetic radiation in much the same way as radio waves. But to accomplish this, Arcade had to be launched high enough to ensure that there was no interference from Earth's atmosphere. Since the universe is constantly expanding at unimaginable speed, light from distant stars loses energy as it travels and eventually shifts down to radio waves. This means that the sounds picked up by the machine would give us a look at ancient stars as they existed at the beginning of their lives. And so Arcade was sent up to a height of 23 miles, where it started picking up signals as expected. But to the surprise of everyone involved, it picked up a signal that was six times louder than anything cosmologists had expected. This caused a lot of confusion, since the sound was too loud to be coming from distant stars, and even louder than the combined radio emissions from distant galaxies. It also caused a big problem, as the sound could stop us from searching for signals from the stars that came into existence after the Big Bang. Months of research would ultimately reveal that the signal wasn't being emitted from one single source, but from all around the universe. The signal has been named Radio Synchrotron Background, and although we've known since the 1960s that distant galaxies can release signals like this, there simply aren't enough galaxies out there to explain why the roar is six times louder than expected. This has some exciting implications, as it could mean that there's something out there in space that we still haven't uncovered. But for now, the space roar remains a strange mystery. During the 1930s, the United Fruit Company uncovered something that cannot be explained by science, even today. 
The company had traveled to the coast of Costa Rica to search for new and fertile land where they could expand their banana plantations. When they reached the Diquis Valley in the country's southwest region, they believed that they'd found the perfect area and started clearing land to plant their crops. But while this was underway, they stumbled upon something that no one expected. What they found was an assortment of over 300 perfectly round stone spheres, some measuring only a few centimeters in diameter, while others were as big as two meters. The largest of the spheres is estimated to weigh around 16 tons. Though they may look perfectly spherical to the human eye, scientists soon discovered that they aren't, but they are pretty close to perfect. They also found that the stones are made from granodiorite, which is an indigenous rock similar to granite. The first of these spheres was located in the Taraba River Delta, also known as the Diquis River. But the stones have also been found as far away as the Estrella Valley, to the north, and the Coto Colorado River to the south. What's even more baffling is that most of the spheres were found further than 25 miles away from any rock quarries, and sadly, most of the rocks have been removed from their original spots by locals who use them as decorative lawn ornaments. Six of the spheres have, however, been preserved in the National Museum in San Jose. As for their origin, there are no definitive answers. Archaeologists and scientists who have studied the stones have only been able to theorize about where they came from, thanks to other artifacts found in the same areas. It's believed that they were created between 800 AD and the 1500s, and most likely were crafted by ancestors of native tribes that lived in the area during the time of the Spanish Inquisition. Some people speculate that they were used as a status symbol or to mark the property of a tribal chief. It's thought that they may also have navigational purposes, as many of them were discovered facing north, often between other spheres that together formed shapes or patterns. Unfortunately, the chances of us ever learning their true origin or function is very slim, as most of these answers would have disappeared along with the creators of the stones. The Nazca Lines were first discovered in 1553 by Pedro Cieza de Leon, who described them as trail markers. 33 years later, Luis Monzon visited Peru, and he described seeing ancient ruins that included the remains of ancient roads. At the time, the lines were only visible from high up on hilltops. But in 1927, a Peruvian archaeologist saw them while he was hiking in Peru's foothills, and he would later discuss them at a conference in Lima in 1939. The first person to be credited with an in-depth study of the lines is Paul Kosak, a historian from New York's Long Island University. Kosak had been in Peru in 1940 and 1941 to study irrigation systems used by ancient civilizations when he flew over the lines and realized that they were far more than just markers or roads. He noticed that the lines he was traveling above formed the shape of a bird and later discovered that some of the lines converged on the horizon at the winter solstice in the southern hemisphere. This intrigued him, and he started to study the origins as well as the possible purpose of the lines. Together with Richard Schadel, an American archaeologist, and Maria Reich, a German mathematician and archaeologist, they speculated that the lines were used as astronomical markers on the horizon, since the lines were found to show where the sun and some other celestial bodies rose on important dates, such as the solstices. It's believed that they were created with the use of simple tools and surveying equipment, as wooden stakes have been found in the ground at the end of some of the lines. When one of the stakes was carbon dated, it was aged between 500 BC and 500 AD. The lines are actually trenches that were created by removing iron oxide pebbles that cover the ground, exposing the lightly colored clay on the earth underneath. Several hundred of these figures have been found, some depicting animals and others representing human forms. The lines cover a massive area of almost 170 square miles, with the largest of the figures discovered so far measuring 1,200 feet. 
Though many theories have been put forward as to their true purpose, such as irrigation schemes or fertility symbols, this remains more speculation as there are still many questions that remain unanswered. In 2003, scientists using sonar to explore the bottom of the Sea of Galilee made an underwater discovery that needs explaining. About 30 feet beneath the surface of the lake, they found a circular structure measuring larger than the length of a Boeing 747 jet. This surprised them as the bottom of the lake is usually very smooth and the discovery seemed oddly out of place. At first, they didn't think that the structure would hold much importance, but when they consulted with archaeologists, they were told that it resembles an unusually large bronze statue. The structure, which is made up of basalt rocks, measures 230 feet at the base, 32 feet in height, and is believed to weigh around 60,000 tons. To give some perspective, it measures twice the size of the stone circle found at Stonehenge. At first, it was believed that it was built as a type of fish estuary, but it's since been speculated that it was built on dry land and later submerged by the waters of the lake. This has more important geophysical implications, as it means that the Sea of Galilee had a far lower water level than it does today. Due to the fact that the structure is submerged, it's been hard to study and to excavate, as it's a very hard and expensive enterprise. Hence, the exact age of the discovery has not been determined. But given that sand accumulates at between 1 and 4 millimeters per year, it's believed to be between 2,000 and 12,000 years old, since there's between 6 and 10 feet of sand accumulated at the base of the structure. There have been theories put forward that it may have served as a ceremonial structure, a ramp, or as a burial site, though this remains pure conjecture. What is known, however, is that the creation of the cairn was an impressive feat for the people who inhabited the area at the time since the stones are estimated to weigh around 200 pounds. Scientists also believe that the structure would have had great importance to those who built it, but until we can study it further, it remains an archaeological mystery. On the dawn of the 14th of April, 1561, the skies over Nuremberg, Germany erupted into what is still considered to be an event that cannot be explained and it has left scientists as well as ufologists baffled for centuries. The event is described in a broadsheet newspaper that was printed that same month. The text explains that between 4 and 5 a.m. that morning, many people in Nuremberg witnessed a celestial event that started with what appeared to be two blood-red semicircular arcs in the middle of the sun. There was a color surrounding the sun, also described as dark red, and inside of it were dark and metallic colored balls that seemed to hover within the sun's radius. On either side and around the sun, much like the shape of a donut, were more of these red balls, accompanied by a growing number of spheres. Some of the balls lined up in threes, while others formed a square in numbers of four, while others still hovered by themselves. In between the spheres, people saw red crosses and rods that also seemed to stay together in groups of three and four. Suddenly, a fight seemed to break out between the objects, with some of the globes attacking each other and trading places at random. This went on for an hour in full view of the people who had now gathered to watch the strange phenomenon. Then the objects seemed to fatigue and started moving slower ultimately falling down towards Earth, seemingly burning as they fell and producing large quantities of smoke as they hit the ground. Following this, what appeared is described as a massive black spear, the shaft of which pointed to the east and the tip pointing to the west. Due to the strange nature of the sighting, there have been many varying explanations given as to what these people may have seen. Psychologist Carl Jung argued that these types of sightings were witnessed by more than one person and are likely symbolic representations of collective consciousness. There have also been obvious claims that the objects were extraterrestrial in nature, but we are left without answers and the true cause of the strange celestial phenomenon may very well remain an unsolved mystery forever.
In 2019, a creepy security camera video went viral, which some people believe still defies explanation. The video was shot at a hospital in northern India. The hospital in question is the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, and actually is nearby to one of the city's paranormal hotspots. A bridge that leads to the hospital has earned the nickname simply Haunted Bridge. Travelers are said to have seen a woman wearing a traditional doctor's outfit, holding up a lamp. It's said the specter is the ghost of a doctor who passed away in a road accident 20 years ago. There isn't a huge record of ghosts in the hospital itself, but it's not hard to imagine that those that spent their final moments in the institute have imprinted themselves on the location. Apparently, one such ghost was keen to get away from the hospital. The video was uploaded in September of 2019, with comments from the security guard featured on the clip. It shows the entrance and exit of the hospital, where an empty wheelchair is parked up alongside two ordinary chairs. The wheelchair begins to move by itself, changing direction and heading towards a ramp leading to the road. The chair seems to move to avoid crashing into the side of the ramp, at one point turning 90 degrees. A security guard seems to see the movement and come outside to see what was going on. The guard in question was a man named Manaj Kumar, who said that he'd gone to get a drink when he saw the chair. He also claimed to have felt a chill. However, in a later interview, he said he didn't think it was a ghost. Apparently, the area is more open than it appears in the video, and it was wind rather than any being or invisible hand that caused the chair to roll away. Wind can be seen shaking some of the trees in the background of the video, but it's not an explanation that has convinced everybody. The way the chair moves definitely seems to be purposeful, and some people online don't believe something like the wind could have caused it. Some staff at the hospital also agree, as the creepy footage made them reluctant to work the night shift. If this was a ghost trying to make their escape, let's hope they were able to let go of whatever was keeping them in the hospital. In 2014, a theater in East London published security footage from inside one of its rooms, taken in the early hours of a Sunday morning. At first, the CCTV footage doesn't appear to show much, but on repeated watches, subtle eerie things can be made out. The footage was discovered by the theater manager, Jai Seppel. He had been the last person to leave the theater the night before. As was his routine, he had straightened all the chairs before leaving, and was a little confused when he arrived in the morning to find one out of place. A table at the back of the room had also been slightly shifted. Thinking somebody might have broken in, he went through and checked the security camera footage, and that was when he noticed the eerie moment the chair and table appeared to move by themselves. The movements are small and would have been missed if Jai hadn't been looking for them. When the footage was posted to social media, it was met with skepticism and enthusiasm. It's not the most flashy of paranormal activity videos, which both sides see as evidence to their belief. Some questioned why someone would go through the trouble of watching hours of footage for such a small thing, while others questioned why someone would bother with such a small hoax. Some people pointed out what appears to be a faint mist by the door as well as orbs that fly through the scene. Orbs are the most commonly captured evidence of paranormal activity, but are easily explained as bugs or dust captured close to the camera. The theater manager claimed there have been multiple instances of paranormal activity in the theater, but this is the first time it's been captured on camera. What makes this even stranger is that it comes hours after a psychic medium put on a show at the theater. The medium, Roy Roberts, claimed he felt a strong presence on stage, but didn't know why. If this was faked, it would make more sense to have done it before the performance in order to attract attention to the supernatural performer. In a lot of ways, just how small this unexplained activity caught on camera is makes it even harder to explain. The Long Arms Pub in Wiltshire, England is one of many pubs and bars in the country vying for the position of the most haunted pub. 
According to local news outlets, paranormal activity is so frequent here, it's just become part of everyday life. But in December of 2021, it was the first time that unexplained activity was caught on camera. The pub landlady, Liz, was chatting with the customer at the bar, while another worker was cleaning a little way down the bar. Liz steps away from the bar to open up the conversation to another bartender. As they're talking, a small crash can be heard and one of the glasses on the bottom shelf behind the bar shatters. The glass that shatters was sat slightly apart from the other glasses on the shelf. According to the landlord, it was a toughened Guinness pint glass which was resting upside down on a drip mat. The bottom of these glasses are toughened to stop it from shattering if it's ever dropped. It should have been able to handle a smash like that even if something had fallen on top of it, which doesn't seem to be the case. Liz and her husband who own the pub don't have an explanation for what happened besides the paranormal. According to the couple, there are a number of specters that join the living in the bar. These include two women in black and white outfits and large hats that collect apples from a tree in the backyard. Children that will sit with diners and a black and white dog. The black and white dog is believed to be the ghost of a pet of the previous owner, and the couple suspect much of the paranormal activity can be attributed to him. Before the couple took ownership, the pub had been owned by the same family, the Longs family, for more than 100 years. Given that history, it's understandable why the previous owner might have been reluctant to leave it to the new owners after all this time. None of the activity so far has been threatening, and for now it remains an interesting quirk of the establishment. But if the shattered glass is the first sign of more paranormal activity, it might not remain non-threatening forever. The story behind the creepy footage of a possibly paranormal doll came to light in 2019, but it began at the end of the Second World War. In 2019, a man named Michael Diamond shared footage of the strange doll doing something completely unexplained. Michael was a collector of all things creepy and weird and worked as a traveling entertainer. It was at one of the festivals he was working at that he was approached by an antiques dealer who claimed that he had something that might interest Michael. It was Mr. Fritz, all that remains of a ventriloquist doll that was created in the Second World War. According to the antique dealer, it had been created by an American prisoner of war named Billy Booth out of German newspaper, smuggled paint and potato starch. It was designed to keep spirits up within the camp. Private Booth was one of many prisoners who lost their lives in the camp, but the doll survived and was given to his family when the camp was liberated. Decades after the war, it found its way into an antique mall where it was bought by the dealer. Mr. Fritz was put into the dealer's shop, but immediately strange things began to happen. The door to the doll's case would open every night, and sometimes it appeared the eyes and mouth would move. The dealer thought there would be a rational explanation, but couldn't find one. After trying to keep the door closed by taping it shut, the dealer eventually gave up and left it in his garden shed, deciding it was too strange to sell. Even without any backstory, the doll was creepy enough for Michael to purchase. Andy put it in his freak room with his other collectibles, which included the wax head of the elephant boy and a pair of Houdini's handcuffs. The same paranormal activity that had spooked the antique dealer occurred at Michael's home. His wife and daughter didn't like the doll, but Michael had grown attached to it. Even so, he wanted an explanation for the weird movements and the door mysteriously opening by itself. He set up a security camera for two nights, and on both nights, strange unexplained things were captured. The eyes and mouth of the doll open and close, with the controls clearly visibly moving. The door swings open without anyone touching it. The footage still defies explanation. How much of the backstory is legitimate isn't clear, but if true, it could well be Private Booth still wanting to entertain after all these years. Dover Castle is said to be one of the most haunted castles in the United Kingdom. It sits in a position to overlook the narrowest stretch of the English Channel and has been the site of many battles and tragedies. 
the site has been the location of one stronghold or another for 2,000 years, and the current castle dates back to the 1180s. In that time, the history that has occurred here appears to have seeped into the walls, and some has been caught on camera. There are a number of resident ghosts in the castle. The most famous is of a drummer who lost his wife while running an errand which allegedly involved carrying a large sum of money. The people who claimed his life took the money and left his spirit to wander around the castle. He's sometimes seen but more often heard with the slow methodical drumming having no explainable source. Other ghosts that are said to linger here include a woman who is sometimes seen wearing a red dress and soldiers from a number of historical conflicts. The castle was in use all the way up to World War II, where it served as a hospital and gathering point for forces before the Normandy invasions. Visitors to the castle have heard terrifying and pained screams, presumably of spirits reliving the most painful moments of their lives. One such case is that of a TV crew who were outside the castle walls when they heard a chilling scream coming from above. They thought someone had fallen from the battlements and rushed to get out of the way of the falling body. But the scream stopped and nobody was ever found. Most of the paranormal activity appears to be concentrated inside the castle, in particular in the underground passageways. But the grounds are also home to spirits. In 2014, this CCTV video was posted onto the internet, which appears to show something unexplained. A dark shadow crosses in front of an open gate, appearing to materialize more as it goes. It reaches the other side and appears to begin walking towards the camera before disappearing. While this could all be brushed off as an effect of the camera, or even a bug in front of the lens, that doesn't explain the confused security guard that runs up moments later. The guard clearly saw something and ran up to check what it was, only to look around confused when there was nothing there. There may well be a reasonable explanation for this creepy video, but for now it remains unexplained. The disappearance of Tiffany Sessions is one of the most famous missing person cold cases to come out of America in the 1980s. Tiffany has now been missing for more than 33 years, but new tips about her disappearance continued to come in, even as recently as 2020. Tiffany was a 20-year-old college student studying finance when she disappeared in February of 1989. She'd gotten into a new fitness program for the new year, which included a short walk in her local area of Gainesville, Florida. It was an effort to improve her life, but may have been a routine that cost it. Between 4 and 5 p.m. on February 19th, she set off for what would have been a short power walk. She had an exam on campus that evening, so her flatmate assumed that she would be back within a few hours at the latest so that she could have time to get ready. She had left behind her wallet, keys, and ID, and there was no indication she was planning on being out for very long. As the hours passed, her flatmate became more and more worried. She drove along the route that Tiffany typically took, searching for any sign of her friend, but she was nowhere to be seen. At about 9 p.m., she contacted Tiffany's mother and then the police. Adult missing person cases often don't get very much attention at first, and Tiffany's case was no exception. It's hard for police to know for certain that the missing person in question didn't vanish of their own accord. Police did do a search of the area, but couldn't find anything out of place. There was no sign of a struggle or indication that anywhere on Tiffany's exercise route was actually a crime scene. But as time went on, they came to the conclusion that Tiffany had probably been kidnapped. The largest search in Florida's history got underway. Tiffany's father was a successful businessman with good connections and was able to get the case a lot of publicity with the help of professional athletes and other celebrities. All the attention led to hundreds of leads being called in. Some were claims of seeing Tiffany alive in places as far away as Hawaii, while others were recollections of strange events that happened on the night that Tiffany disappeared. Some tips were ruled as mistaken identities, others were complete hoaxes, 
Some of the tips even led to solving other unrelated crimes, but none led to finding Tiffany. As recently as 2020, new tips came in. A woman who had been a teenager at the time described seeing a woman matching Tiffany's description being dragged away by a man in a red pickup truck. At the time, her father said it was probably just a lover's argument and to not worry about it. But years later, she decided it may lead police to answers. They dug up areas of the forest where the witness had seen the two people and found what was described as evidence to be processed, but no sign of Tiffany herself. The main suspect in the case is a man named Paul Rolls. Rolls was convicted for taking the lives of multiple women. After he passed away in prison, a diary was found where he apparently listed the dates of his crimes. Next to the number two was the date that Tiffany disappeared. His grandson also claimed that Rolls had given his daughter an expensive looking watch shortly after Tiffany vanished. Tiffany had been wearing a Rolex while on her walk, which has never been recovered. However, Rolls' daughter likely pawned the watch and it's impossible to confirm whether it had actually belonged to Tiffany. The case remains active and the Sessions family have maintained a reward of $25,000 for information leading to Tiffany's whereabouts. Tiffany was 5 foot 3 inches tall when she vanished and 125 pounds. She had shoulder length blonde hair and was wearing a white sweatshirt and red sweatpants. Anyone with information that could help solve this case should contact the sheriff's office at 352-367-4000. Juanita Nielsen disappeared under extremely suspicious circumstances in 1975. She'd been trying to do what was best for her community, but it may have ended up costing her her life. Juanita was a journalist and heiress from the King's Cross area of Sydney, Australia. Her family had earned its riches as owners of a successful department store, where Juanita briefly worked when she was younger. Her father purchased the Now newspaper, which Juanita took over in the early 1970s. She made the newspaper a real community outlet, where she championed the causes of her King's Cross neighbors. In particular, it was a campaign against redevelopment that drew attention from the wrong crowds. A property developer named Frank Thiemann wanted to tear down Victoria Street to redevelop the area. Naturally, people who lived in those houses weren't happy with this. With Juanita's help, they campaigned for the area to get protected status. It worked for a while, but eventually the organization that had given the protection backed down. Thiemann had a lot of money, resources, and people to throw at the campaign in Victoria Street. One of those people was Abe Saffron, an organized crime boss that had money tied up in the redevelopment. A string of crimes hit Victoria Street. A number of outspoken residents were kidnapped in order to have their mind changed and Juanita herself was on such a list. On June 30th, two of Saffron's men came to her house with intentions of kidnapping her, only for the door to be answered by her boyfriend. They backed out of the plan but apparently launched a new one. On July 4th, 1975, Juanita visited a club owned by Saffron. The club apparently wanted advertising in Juanita's newspaper. She arrived at the club and was never seen again. In the following investigation, some of Juanita's personal belongings were found, but there was no trace of the missing woman. Two people were eventually convicted of the initial attempted kidnapping, but her actual disappearance, at least legally, remains a mystery. Her family has offered a substantial reward for anyone that can help locate Juanita and solve the mystery of what happened to her. It was 13 days before Christmas and four days before the ship she was on was due to dock back home in Portsmouth when Simon Parks disappeared on the 12th of December, 1986. Police are still working to solve this unsolved missing person cold case, which may be linked to a man who was imprisoned for taking the lives of two people exactly one year apart. Simon had joined the Royal Navy straight out of school when he was only 18 years old and left Portsmouth with 684 other crew members. The patrol had been uneventful and Illustrious was on her way back to the UK when Simon vanished. Gibraltar, a British territory in southern Spain, 
was the last stop before the final leg of the journey home. Simon called his mother as they docked. His family was going to meet him in Portsmouth, and he wanted to make sure that they had the right paperwork to get to the dock. He had already bought Christmas presents for them and was obviously looking forward to the reunion. Like many of the sailors on board, Simon took shore leave to go ashore while the illustrious was docked. He visited some bars and was last seen by his fellow sailors at the Horseshoe Bar. He told them he was going to get some food before leaving, and the other sailors left him behind. He may have also been seen later at another bar. The sailor who thought he saw Simon later on said that he appeared to be quite drunk. When the Illustrious was ready to depart on December 14th, there was no sign of Simon. After a quick investigation, they realized that he hadn't been seen since the night of the 12th. His passport and personal belongings were still on the ship, so a voluntary absence was ruled out. In the years that have followed, numerous searches of Gibraltar have been conducted but no trace of Simon has ever been found. As recently as 2019, a graveyard in the territory was searched after a tip was given, and bones were found, but they were discovered to have been from animals. In 2001, Simon's disappearance was linked to another man who'd been aboard the Illustrious at the time. That year, Alan Grimson was found guilty for taking the lives of two people in Portsmouth. The first crime took place on December 12, 1997. The second took place exactly a year later. It was theorized that the date may have been significant to him, and police believed he had taken more lives, including Simon's. Grimson denied and continues to deny any involvement in Simon's disappearance. He claims his first victim was Nicholas Wright in 1997. He had then recreated his first crime in 1998, and the date was not significant. For now, the case remains an unsolved mystery, and anyone with information should contact the National Missing Persons Helpline. Laura Mason was celebrating her 45th birthday when she vanished without a trace in 1993. It was four days after her birthday when she was last seen outside of a club in Kansas City, Missouri. She worked as a nursing assistant and a loving mother who was looking forward to letting her hair down. On the evening of March 24th, an unnamed relative dropped Laura off at a jazz club called El Capitan Lounge, where her loved ones thought that she was going to spend the night. It was a club she knew well. It was owned by her former brother-in-law, Richard Stallings, who was on relatively good terms with the family. Laura was last seen in Stallings' car. What happened next remains a mystery. According to Stallings, he drove her to a nearby intersection as she wanted to visit the Mutual Musicians Foundation instead of the club. But Stallings' story changed multiple times, leaving police questioning what really happened. Stallings came under even more scrutiny when two years later, he was found guilty of taking the life of another woman, Donna Meredith who he had dated and become incredibly possessive over after she ended the relationship. Given the violence he showed towards Donna and towards men who he thought might be interested in her, it was thought that he was capable of doing something horrific to Laura. Stallings still denied any involvement in her disappearance as well as taking Donna's life. The case went cold, but in 2015, Police received a tip that Laura's remains were buried in the backyard of a house that Stallings had previously lived at. Police dug up the backyard but found nothing, putting Laura's friends and family back in the same limbo they'd been in for more than 20 years. The case is still open and unsolved. While Stallings remains the obvious suspect, it's always possible that he did drop her off when he said he did, and someone else snatched Laura. Laura is described as an African-American woman with black hair and brown eyes, 5 foot 6 inches tall and 140 pounds when she vanished. The Kansas City Police Department is investigating the case and can be contacted on 816-234-5136. Laura's family try to keep her memory alive with a foundation that helps underserved children in their local community. On January 26, 1978, Peter Winston left a friend's house in New York City, never to be seen again. 
He was never reported missing, and the fate of the young man that had once been a promising chess prodigy remains a mystery. Peter had been singled out as very gifted and intelligent at a young age. He went to the first gifted and talented school of its kind, and all of his classmates and teachers regarded him as one of the most intelligent people they knew. His love for chess also began at an early age, and by the age of 14, he was already beating grandmasters. But like a lot of geniuses, he struggled with finding the right level of stimulation, began to use recreational substances, and his mental health took a turn for the worst. Doctors were undecided on what mental health condition he actually had, but prescribed Peter with lithium. Peter believed the medicine stopped his mind from performing at its best ability, and saw his chest performances getting worse and worse. At one point, he stopped his medication cold turkey, which made people believe he was using illegal substances. He may well have been using these illegal substances and alcohol to self-medicate. By the start of 1978, he seemed to be having another breakdown. He called a college friend, Charles Hurton, while Charles was away on his winter break, asking him to come back immediately. Charles didn't, but stopped at Peter's home when he did return to New York. At Peter's request, he went to a horse racing track on January 25th, where Peter gambled away the money that he had. Charles eventually lost his friend in the crowd, and after searching for him for a while, figured that Peter could look after himself. After the last race, Peter tried to call an old chess rival for a lift home. How he got the number for where the rival was staying was a mystery, and the lift never came. He then called his sister, who did pick him up and took him back to her home. The following morning, she told him that he needed to go to the doctors, at which point he ran off. For some reason, Peter decided to visit another friend, who invited him in for lunch. Peter was acting extremely strangely. Together with his unkempt look and mutterings about author Walter Korn being God, it was clear Peter was not well. His friend's parents decided to phone his mother. After learning about this, Peter ran out of the house and it was the last anyone heard of him. Peter had been talking about going to see Walter Korn in Texas, but given he didn't have any money, ID, or even a coat, it seems unlikely he made it that far. The blizzard of 1978 gripped New York shortly after, and it seems unlikely he survived the storm if he hadn't already found shelter at that point. He was never reported missing, and no search party ever went out, leaving the fate of this promising young man a mystery. A weird science discovery in space is still as amazing today as when the discovery was first made in 2019, and just as unsolved. Coming from a galaxy billions of light years away are unknown space signals that expert engineers simply cannot explain. Astronomers named this astonishing discovery FRB 20191221A. The letters in FRB stand for fast radio bursts, which means radio waves sent from an unknown object in short controlled bursts of energy from space. Experts are trying to determine what kind of object is broadcasting radio waves from galaxies away and for what purpose. Here's where this scientific discovery gets really weird. Not only is the object sending these deep space signals unknown, but the signals themselves are incredibly powerful and impossible to predict. The unknown object blasts a concentrated signal into space, generating as much energy in a single millisecond as would take the sun over 10,000 years to produce. Due to the extreme distance from Earth, the event can only be detected by sensitive space engineering equipment. What initially made the 2019 fast radio burst gain the attention of the science community was how long it lasted. While other signals last just a few milliseconds, this signal lasted a full three seconds, far longer than normal. Even stranger, the radio waves repeated every 200 milliseconds, which scientists described as being like a heartbeat. Whatever is out there causing this universal heartbeat is one of the greatest unexplained mysteries of space. Once scientists figure out what's causing these unexplained events, they hope the information can lead to solving even greater unsolved mysteries of the universe, like how fast the universe is expanding, 
and maybe even where it's expanding too. One weird science theory is that this could be a source of life similar to our own. If these radio bursts are deliberate, then they were sent billions of years ago, meaning the civilization is likely long gone or much different by the time it reaches our planet. On Christmas Eve 2015, NASA released high-quality images of Pluto taken by the New Horizons spacecraft months earlier. The slightly unnerving images show the dwarf planet's features for the first time. Most notable for many was the heart shape on the photo, but hidden in the heart was a strange phenomenon that has since become a creepy unsolved internet mystery. Images from space show a very strange characteristic of the photo, a possible space snail. The snail-like creature is near a natural X marking on the ground which makes this unnerving image even more of a disturbing space oddity. NASA scientists were initially puzzled by the unknown object, but like most of the strange space discoveries of this type, the photo of Pluto's snail problem probably isn't as much of an unexplained event as the public would like to believe. One possible solution for this strange space mystery involves Pluto's natural atmosphere and climate. As the experts will explain, Pluto has layers of nitrogen ice that periodically warm, causing the ground to expand with heat and contract while cooling. The deep ridges mark where the nitrogen has sunk back down and cooled off. The alleged snail from the photo could have been a piece of water melting on top of nitrogen during this natural environmental process. But within such an answer lies another unexplained mystery. Space scientists have discovered ice on much of Pluto's surface, but as far as NASA's equipment has been able to determine, water is absent from the area where the snail was found. If so, then how this snail could be a piece of ice in an area devoid of water remains an unexplained mystery. One of the greatest unexplained mysteries of outer space is happening at the very center of our own galaxy. Universal events so puzzling that experts simply cannot fully explain what's going on. What little we know about this area of science is weird and one of history's greatest mysteries. When someone says cosmic rays, most people probably envision something similar to rays of light. However, cosmic rays are more like tiny space particles that contain the smaller parts of an atom. In fact, the protons, electrons, and neutrons that make up the atom can be found in an unassembled state within cosmic rays. In other words, these mysterious space streams called cosmic rays contain the ingredients needed to make an atom, and we're not even sure where such a substance originally comes from. The scientists who have been tracking the mystery substance for a number of years have recently made an amazing discovery. An abundance of cosmic rays are leaking from the very center of the Milky Way galaxy. That's already weird enough, but then in 2021, scientists in China made another startling space discovery. The scientific community likewise cannot explain. Something in the very center of our galaxy, a black hole perhaps, is producing cosmic rays and releasing them in all directions. What's especially strange is that while particles can leave this mysterious center, some kind of barrier will not let particles come in. The unexplained mystery is called the cosmic ray barrier, and puzzled scientists struggle to understand what its purpose is. If we could somehow see into this mysterious middle portion of our galaxy, it would be just as amazing as when we first explained the center of the Earth. The hidden secrets behind such amazing discoveries could lead to a better understanding of the world around us on a scale that was once thought impossible. This strange space mystery at the center of our galaxy needs more research, but that might only turn up even more strange questions, as any new branch of weird science should. Space experts still wonder if there's life on Mars. It's an unexplained mystery even though the scientific community largely suggests that life on Mars never went past the microbial level. But with so many creepy photos from Mars, there may have been many strange unknown objects caught on camera to suggest something larger than microorganisms is waiting for scientific discovery. 
The Mars rover, called Perseverance, has been collecting Martian rock samples, which one day will be sent back to Earth for further scientific study. In a creepy photo taken by the rover in July of 2022, the small unknown object appears next to a space rock that the rover was drilling into for scientific samples. As rumors spread that the amazing discovery was finally proof of intelligent life on Mars, NASA doesn't believe that's the true story behind this case. Zooming in on the image shows what looks like a bundle of string. Although this is ultimately an unexplained mystery, NASA believes the bundle of string is a piece of netting used in thermal blankets when the Perseverance first landed on the planet. It's not the first piece of space debris from the landing that Perseverance has photographed during its time on Mars. If this explanation is true, then the space mystery is solved, and not the amazing discovery most would have hoped it would be. However, a small but skeptical community has their own weird science theories as well, and continues to search for evidence to present an untold story of intelligent life. On August 14, 2019, a North American observatory detected sharp changes in gravity. The data showed the gravitational change was caused by a massive event in outer space that cannot be explained. Baffled scientists around the world have determined that two unknown objects collided into each other in deep space. One object was roughly two and a half times the size of the Sun. The other was 23 times larger than the Sun. Space experts in Australia and Italy confirmed on their scientific equipment that this bizarre event was real, and weird science theories abound. Since measuring microscopic changes in space gravity is a relatively new technology that has only existed since 2015, everyone is still stumped at this new find. With such equipment, scientists can better track the date and formation of stars and galaxies, but this mystery is unlike anything they've seen before. What these two strange objects were and what happened next is a weird science mystery waiting to be discovered. Scientists know that when two stars at the end of their life cycle begin to orbit each other, it creates tremendous gravitational pulls until they rip apart and explode into a flash of light. Since no such flash of light was detected in this particular space collision, scientists guessed that these were not two stars, but rather two black holes trying to swallow each other. So what happens when two black holes, one twice as large as the sun and the other more than 20, hit each other in space? That's a mystery no one knows the answer to. In fact, the mysterious unexplained event happened 800 billion years ago, and the gravitational wave changes are just now reaching Earth for our analysis. These gravitational changes are able to bend light, change the effects of time, and all sorts of other weird science conjecture that still needs proving. The point is, no one knows what the effects of such gravity waves reaching Earth will be, not even the experts themselves. Nine. Residents of the upscale Sun City Anthem neighborhood in Henderson, Nevada, found a car suspiciously abandoned in a quiet cul-de-sac. Checking their home CCTV footage, they found video of a man caught on camera leaving the vehicle on December 13th. The scary mystery of Stephen Kocher's unsolved disappearance began days earlier. Stephen was 30 years old, unemployed, and without much money. He rented a small room from a man named Brett Bishop in St. George, Utah, and fell several months behind in rent. Brett had contacted Stephen's father, who was listed as a reference, to ask if everything was okay because the rent was so late. When his father called to check on him, Stephen grew frustrated and embarrassed and hung up. The next day, he sent his father a text message to apologize. What he did next remains a strange and unsolved mystery. Either on that evening or the morning after, Stephen drove 560 miles to Ruby Valley, Nevada to the house of an ex-girlfriend named Anne Marie. She wasn't home when he dropped by unannounced, so he stayed and chatted with Anne Marie's parents for a few hours, telling them he was heading to Sacramento to visit family, which was an unusual story because he had no family there to speak of. He disappeared before Anne Marie returned. Stephen went back to his Utah home at 11 p.m. 
He had talked to his sister and mother along the way, but left out the details of his road trip. Two days later, Stephen drove to an unknown destination, stopping for gas at Mesquite, Nevada. He returned to St. George at 8 p.m. and bought Christmas gifts for his niece and nephew. He came back home at 10 p.m., stayed for half an hour, and left again. On December 13th, Stephen was in Las Vegas for reasons unknown when he got a call from his church friend Greg Webb at 8 a.m., who was unable to lead a church service and hoped Stephen could fill in. Stephen explained that he was in Vegas but would head back if needed. Greg told him that he too was in Vegas and not to worry. Two other church members would call to ask Stephen about leading services. At 11.54 a.m., about an hour after receiving the final phone call, Stephen was captured on CCTV in Sun City Anthem, getting out of his car with the possible file under his left arm. Another CCTV camera captured footage of Stephen walking north and promptly disappearing. Days would pass before anyone realized Stephen was a missing person. In his car were flyers for a window cleaning company that he worked for. The homeowners association of the neighborhood spoke to Stephen's boss, who gave them his mobile number and the contact information for Stephen's mother. Voicemail messages were left for both Stephen and his mother. When she heard the car was abandoned, she contacted police. They learned about Stephen's unexplained trips and gathered cell phone data while examining the CCTV footage of the missing person. It's one of the strangest missing person cases the police had ever investigated. After being caught on camera for a final time, Stephen was walking to a particularly bad part of town. There's no more footage, but for the next day, the phone moved around various places. Police traced the cell phone tower signal to Russell Road where the phone stayed for two days before mysteriously disappearing. In his car, police found pillows, blankets, and the Christmas gifts he had bought. His phone charger, passport, and other belongings were found undisturbed in his room. However, no trace of Stephen or any of the belongings he had on his person have ever been found. A private investigator hired by his family does not think Stephen would disappear on purpose but without any evidence of any explanation for Stephen's strange road trips, it's likely this scary mystery will never be solved. The mysterious disappearance of then 21-year-old Mara Murray is one of the creepiest unsolved mysteries ever. At the center of this strange New Hampshire case is a single piece of unsolved CCTV footage, which decades later has left the true crime community baffled. On February 5, 2004, a few days before her mysterious disappearance, Mara was working her campus security job when she received a phone call from her older sister, Kathleen, who had recently been to rehab. Her fiancé had taken her to a liquor store. After the conversation, Mara needed to leave work early because she was so upset. Two days later, Fred, her father, came to visit. She borrowed his car to go to a dorm party for four hours and left around 2.30 a.m. After an hour of driving back to her father's motel, she hit a guardrail. It's unknown if she had been drinking because police did not administer a breathalyzer test. If his story is true, her father did not observe anything unusual about her on that night when he picked her up. The next day, Mara lied in an email to her professors about an imaginary family member passing away. In reality, she was traveling to New England. She left campus at 3.15 p.m. and drove to an ATM, where she was caught on a CCTV camera with her hair up in a bun, as was the typical style for Mara, and she was wearing a light-colored jacket that her parents didn't recognize. Some have also speculated that Mara might have marks on her face, though this could be from poor quality footage. These creepy photos were the only images released to the public decades later. Mara was again caught on camera when she went to a store and purchased $40 worth of adult beverages. In both pieces of CCTV footage, Mara appeared to be alone. She then stopped at the Registry of Motor Vehicles to get car insurance forms. Mara was caught on camera later that night at about 7.25 p.m going east on Route 112 in Haverhill, New Hampshire. 
She spun out near the village of Woodsville under snowy conditions, bounced off a tree, and returned to the eastbound lane facing the wrong way. She had gotten out of the car by the time Butch Atwood, a bus driver, happened upon the scene. The dark coat she wore was different than the one she had been caught on camera with, and her hair was down as well. Mara told Butch that AAA was on the way, which was not true. She didn't know that police had already been contacted by another driver who saw her go off the road. Butch went home and contacted the police as well. When police arrived at 7.46 p.m., Mara had already vanished without a trace. Inside of the car were her college textbooks, toiletries, and contraceptive pills still inside, and the drinks she had been caught on camera buying. A crime scene investigation yielded a red stain on the seats and a red liquid in a Coke bottle, evidence that was probably wine. A search of the immediate area turned up no footprints in the snow, which crime investigators believe could mean she traveled along the road. For some reason, despite learning that she was heading east based on directions found inside of the car, police only searched west of the scene. Since then, there have been numerous searches of the surrounding areas, including nearby woods, but the missing person has never been found. A few months after she vanished into thin air, a witness reported seeing a young person walking east on the road a few miles away, sometime between 8 and 8.30 p.m., on the same day of her disappearance. He wouldn't be sure it was her, but the mysterious person did match Mara's description. There's been little progress in the case since 2004, though police continue to follow up leads and search for Mara. Her family believe foul play is likely. Her father said some dirtbag was responsible for taking her. This comment led to one of the creepiest internet mysteries ever, with the infamous 112 dirtbag video on YouTube. Posted on the anniversary of Mara's disappearance, a very scary person is laughing in the footage. Though they were once thought to have been the person responsible for Mara's disappearance, the event would later turn out to be a famous hoax. Mara's family have used the internet to try to get her unsolved case out to the public. That has led to support and a flood of tips to police, but also more hoaxes and accusations. Whatever happened to Mara, it's a famously scary mystery that will hopefully one day be solved. The disappearance of Lisa Govan is one of the scariest unsolved mysteries of Western Australia. What makes Lisa's case particularly creepy is the fact that someone alive today almost certainly knows what has happened to her, a person who has kept a dark secret for more than two decades. Lisa vanished on October 8, 1999. The main problem her case faced was corrupt law enforcement, who would protect a notorious biker gang by making sure their cases went unsolved. Such an unsavory town was the scene of a scary true crime mystery. On the evening of October 7th, Lisa chatted with her mother on the phone, then took her boyfriend to work because the weather was too hazardous to safely ride his motorcycle. Lisa then went to the safari nightclub. The following day, Lisa's boyfriend couldn't get a hold of her. None of her friends or family had any idea what happened to her, and she was reported missing. CCTV footage from the nightclub was soon uncovered by police and shared with media to help get her unsolved case quickly solved. The surveillance system showed Lisa in the entrance to the club and later outside. She was chatting with other patrons and seemed to be having a good time. Police wanted to speak with anybody in the footage who Lisa had interacted with that night. Of particular interest was a bald man caught by CCTV cameras meeting Lisa. The two got in a taxi together and left the club at about 4.45 a.m. For some reason, Lisa asked the taxi to return to the nightclub. She was then seen talking with a blonde woman before leaving again. Police wanted to know who this man was, though he wasn't a criminal suspect yet. The man from the CCTV footage revealed himself to be a friend of Lisa's. If his story is true, Lisa was interested in him romantically despite having a boyfriend. They were on their way back to his place when she remembered a friend at the club who she forgot to say goodbye to. The unnamed man had expected Lisa to come back to his home afterwards, 
But as the strange mystery goes, he never saw her again, and she never answered his calls. Police traced Lisa's final moments of the night to the Foundry Hotel, the headquarters of the Dero's Outlaw motorcycle gang. Lisa was thought to have been in a relationship with Andrew Edhouse, a dangerous criminal who had allegedly been with Lisa earlier that night. CCTV footage suggests that they may have shared a kiss the night that Lisa vanished. After playing pool, Lisa left the clubhouse between 7.30 and 7.45 and was seen outside by two more bikers who later told criminal investigators that they let her leave without incident. Lisa's family believe this story is not true at all and suspect a criminal mystery is involved. Solving the case has not been easy due to a strict code of silence enforced by the notorious gang. When one person spoke to police about what he knew about Lisa's final hours, he was targeted shortly thereafter. The bullet missed, but it was a clear warning to everyone to not speak about the true story behind the dark and disturbing events of that night. Not even a $250,000 reward has been enough to get this crime mystery solved. Over the years, there have been police raids on various locations with suspected criminal ties to the gang. In 2018, concrete floors were cut up in a search for more forensic evidence. What exactly they were looking for remains unknown to the public. Police admit that rather than a motorcycle gang, it's possible Lisa ran into trouble with a taxi driver on the morning of her unsolved disappearance. Her case would be solved rather quickly if her missing body was ever to be found at one of the area's many discontinued mine shafts. Wherever she is, police and even the family doubt if the missing person will ever be found alive again. But her family hopes to one day learn what happened to her and finally lay her to rest. In 2011, Rebecca Coriam was a 24-year-old British woman working aboard the Disney Wonder Cruise ship. While the ship was between Los Angeles and Puerto Vallarta, Rebecca mysteriously disappeared without a trace. Only a short CCTV clip provided any real clues as to what happened. Rebecca began a romantic relationship with another cruise worker named Tracy, an American woman. Tracy had a boyfriend, a cruise worker named Devin, who was on shore leave when the tryst began. The relationship did not end upon his return to the ship in March of that year. Months later, a scary mystery would go down as one of the darkest moments in Disney's entire history. The three spent the evening at the bar before going back to Devin's cabin. And in the early hours of May 22nd, Rebecca left wearing Devin's clothes. The cabin door was left unlocked so she could return, but she went missing instead, never to be found. When Rebecca didn't show up for work that morning, the ship was searched and the Mexican Coast Guard was alerted. The ship continued on to its destination in Mexico, with Rebecca still a missing person. An investigation quickly turned up two clues. The first was a flip-flop found on Deck 5, which was the staff pool that allegedly belonged to Rebecca. However, written on the sandal was a different employee's name and cabin number entirely. Still, an internal investigation by Disney concluded that this was Rebecca's flip-flop and that a wave must have taken her overboard during her final moments of life. Baffled experts disputed this theory, arguing that a 100-foot tall wave would be needed to wash Rebecca over the 6-foot tall walls surrounding Deck 5. Strangest of all, the area was under security surveillance and yet no CCTV footage of Rebecca's final mysterious moments were ever found. The second clue in this case is CCTV footage showing her caught on camera at 5.45 a.m. on a phone in a staff room. In the footage, a coworker stops to ask if everything is okay. Rebecca said she was all right, though she looked visibly frazzled. Under maritime law, an official investigation into the unsolved case fell under the jurisdiction of the Bahama authorities, as this was where the ship was legally registered. The Bahamas sent detectives to investigate for a single day, interviewing a mere six people out of an entire cruise ship of potential witnesses. Passengers were allowed to leave the ship without questioning. A private investigator hired by Becca's family discovered potential crime evidence in the form of ripped shorts that had belonged to Rebecca suggesting a struggle had occurred. 
A journalist for The Guardian interviewed her co-workers and learned that she was apparently quite despondent at the time of her mysterious disappearance. Tracy says Rebecca had talked with her about some morbid topics in the past, and of simply ending it all. And just days before she had vanished, Rebecca had become emotional to the point where she banged her head on a steel wall, totally overwhelmed. In August of 2011, months after her disappearance, Rebecca's mother received an email from her bank about suspicious withdrawals from her daughter's account that were not automatic payments. Someone appeared to be using her credit card. Another clue was added to this strange mystery when Rebecca's family tried to access her Facebook account using the password she had given them before she vanished. They were surprised to discover the password no longer worked and had recently been changed. Though it's possible Rebecca had changed the password before she vanished. A year after her unsolved disappearance, her father received an email from a mystery woman in Italy who had a strange story to tell. Apparently, Rebecca was spotted in Venice walking with a dark-haired man. Rebecca's father believes this is a legitimate sighting even though Rebecca's passport had been found with her belongings after she disappeared. Although this case has technically been solved, there are a lot of loose ends, and whether or not CCTV footage of her disappearance exists remains unexplained. Rebecca is one of hundreds of people to disappear from cruise ships under suspicious circumstances. With no further evidence, it's likely this scary mystery will never be solved. Haunting CCTV evidence from a bar in Bathurst, Australia captured the last known movements of Janine Vaughn more than 20 years ago. The 31-year-old was seen getting into a car before disappearing in a dark and disturbing true crime mystery that's yet to be solved. On the night of December 6th, she and two friends, Juanita and Jordan, went to the Metro Tavern, also known as Dirty Tap. When they left the club at about 3.45 a.m., CCTV footage shows Janine with a man named Mark Wright. He appears to ask her one single word, promise. Janine seems to say yes and Mark leaves. Janine becomes visibly frustrated. It's raining, her friends are arguing and she's lost her handbag, which she accidentally left in the tavern. After threatening to walk off, she announces that she's going to the Ox Hotel, which was only a five minute walk away. Her friends follow. The chilling CCTV footage then captures the last known images of Janine before her disturbing disappearance. In the top corner of the screen, a small car passes her and doubles back. Janine gets in and they leave. A total of four witnesses, including Juanita and Jordan, describe the mystery car as small and red. These unnerving images are grainy and in black and white but were enough to confirm the creepy vac stories provided to investigators. Law enforcement officials were looking for someone in a small red car. A number of persons of interest were identified, but there were two that stood out. The first was a local pharmacist who worked in the same shopping complex as Janine, and was a suspect by proxy. He said he had seen his pastor on the night of Janine's disappearance, and spent the rest of the night home alone. The other suspect had been off his medication on the night of her disappearance. He allegedly gave a detailed criminal confession to his friends and spoke of a bladed weapon he had used along with the location where he had left Janine's missing body to be found later. A search turned up no signs of foul play, and the man would later deny all criminal confessions. He said that if he ever had confessed to this scary mystery, the untrue story was a direct result of not taking his medication. However, a small blade was discovered a few days after Janine vanished, in the driveway of a nursing home near where Janine was last seen. A blade with hair and red stains. Police made a big mistake failing to properly store the evidence, which was lost before any real degree of forensic testing could take place. The unsolved case soon went cold despite a number of anonymous tips and a private investigation led by Janine's family. One of the more recent tips came from the family and friends of another person of interest. The witnesses were tracked down by the local paper, the Sydney Morning Herald, and described a disturbingly strange smell coming from the man's property. If this potential horror story is true, then a swarm of insects was found buzzing around the strange smell. 
there's a secret cellar hidden directly underneath the bugs and the stench. Police have been made aware and no further update on the lead has been provided since. Janine's family and friends have continued to push to try to find answers to this unsolved mystery and uncover what really happened after Janine got into the car. A reward for information that can help solve this cold case has been offered. Anyone with information should contact Crime Stoppers at 1-800-333-000. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.